This is Runehammer. like the rest, Jugger. It's drive free or die. Yeah, sure, everyone that takes their junk out there winds up in a smoldering heap of steel, but not you. You've got an edge. Your rig is different. Bigger. Badder. Faster. It's not because you're a good mechanic. <laughs> not because you're a good driver. Hell, you could barely operate a golf cart. What makes the difference is the way this thing is built. It wasn't built by human hands. This engine wasn't tuned by some old man in some dingy garage, no. No. Your machine was built by some kind of artificial intelligence. A machine built by a machine to dominate other machines. You're gonna make it past the stretch. You're gonna see the canyons out in the Badlands. You're gonna kiss this world of cities goodbye. No more smogging for you, Jugger. It's drive free or die. And the secret to this build, the secret to the guns, the speed, the gears, that machine. That machine you found Right after you got out of the joint, down there under the concrete, down in all the pipes below the refineries, down where the city's forgotten where the old city used to be. That machine, that little cube, gold with red, veins of cobalt blue glimmering and those clicking sounds. A machine built by machines. Something back in the joint they used to call the RPG mainframe. Yeah, greetings programs, it's Unkrin Burnall here, welcome back to Northern Runeham area. Welcome new patrons and welcome everybody back to the podcast, good to have you, thanks for tuning in. Been a little bit of a lag here on this podcast, we're looking at, uh, oh geez, what is this, episode 27? Good lord, lord, it's episode 27, somebody stop me, actually don't stop me, this is too fun. Anyhow, <clears throat> hey guys, how you doing? Well, finally getting this podcast done. Thanks everybody for sounding off on the survey about um, you know where we're going to go next. Not only does it give me some great fuel for what you guys are interested in for this particular episode, but it just uh, helps me uh, find my way down into new nooks and crannies for uh, subsequent episodes. So thank you everybody for sounding off on that quick survey. But for now, let's get into this meaty topic right here this is a this is a burly one and we're just gonna dive right in this is a recurring topic too this one uh there's a lot of questions about it and just the the catch word comes up over and over again in the hobby it just keeps popping up like a bad penny like dark man everything every time you think he's gone he just he just pops up somewhere else and that is the question of world building world building in the sense of like What's a cool way to do it? How do I get the most out of it? Can we just talk about it? Because I sure do love doing it. I would argue that uh, as a catchword, as a, as a hobby, as an activity, world building is one of the absolute roots that draws people to RPGs as opposed to other hobbies, as opposed to, 
you know, writing novels as opposed to doing science or doing research or all these other things. Something about world building really tickles a dungeon master itch in a weird way. It's it's one of the things we love doing. And I would argue, no, I wouldn't argue, actually. I'm not going to argue. I'm going to guess that a bunch of you guys listening and girls listening right now are here because of world building. That you, you actually have like five or six worlds, in quotes, sitting around in your files, either in your Google Docs or some weird notebook in some old box in your basement where you design these entire worlds and then kind of put them away thinking someday oh yeah I'm gonna you know play this campaign and I built this whole world and then it kind of just goes into a box and then a few months later a few years later you you do another world build and get it all ready and it's this huge masterful sandbox and it kind of just you know goes away and disappears and and that's not wrong that's not bad you know so many worlds out there get built, especially in RPG land, that then are just shelved. And that doesn't mean that they are failed worlds. That just means that you you moved on. You know, it's just like a, if a painter doesn't hang one of her paintings in a gallery show, it doesn't mean that that painting was a waste of time. And it's the same with world building. So before we really get into this discussion about what this activity is, how to get the most out of it, and, and what the joys and terrors of it are, I just want to invite everybody to think about a simple fact, which is that feel free, feel free to build worlds for the fun of building worlds. Do it with your friends. Do it by yourself. Just do it because it's good for the brain. It's, it's something that can't be denied as a wealthy way to be creative, a rich way to play inside your mind is to create entire universes that are alternate to our own and to explore where that exercise takes you. There doesn't have to be an, out, an outcome. Uh, there doesn't have to be a result. A anyone who sp spends their life doing art or creative endeavors know that the endeavor itself is the reward, is the outcome. Not some predetermined utility to society or others. The doing of art is in itself its own outcome. And so build your worlds with certainty, with joy in your heart. Enjoy it for what it is. There does not have to be an outcome. You don't have to quote unquote use the worlds you create. The creating is in itself the joy. Okay, so I just want to get that out first. Believe in yourself. Enjoy the process. Let it be and let it abide. Okay, so to really delve into this topic, first we're going to talk about kind of where this idea came from and, and where it's frequently used. Then we're going to talk about the two um, most sort of noted methods of world building, which are namely top down, bottom up kind of a reductive binary analysis of such a wide sweeping hobby, but eh, it can be useful to see maybe uh, some alternatives or some options to the way that you want to do your next world. And then finally, I want to get into some specifics. So you guys know how I am. I, I believe that talking about the general is very easy. It's very available to all kinds of creative minds to talk about the general. And, and it's something that we do with great ease and great relaxation. And then I think it's much more difficult to talk about the specific. The specific are where the muscles come into play. That is creative athleticism, is to hit the specifics. Those are the heavy weights of creativity. The cardio is the general. The weights are the specific. So we're going to talk about that at last. Okay. So now the term world building originated, um, you know, at least in the sense that we use it today in, in 1820 um, in physics papers. And, and the, the way that it was used is that we build worlds with alternate models of physical laws to perform thought experiments on possible variations of worlds with different physical laws. And I mean physical laws as in physics. Now, now, the interesting part, as we proceed from 1820 to 1920, is that we go from this sort of, um, you know, more fixed sense of physics to relativity in the early part of the 20th century. And world building is a big part of this progression in seeing not only that imagining variant versions of physics is useful to the mathematician and to the scientist, 
but also begins to narrow our sense of what is possible in physics. And it almost, in some ways, these alternate worlds disprove themselves. Now, this is a, a topic for, um, you know, students of physics more so than the RPG hobby, but this is where we get the term. And so what's interesting is then the term world building as the 20th century unfolds really becomes a term that is then adopted by and, uh, you know, fuels inspiration for novelists and fantasy writers. Now, we all know that the 21st century really in the sort of post Jules Verne era <laughs> is is the dawn of what we now consider fantasy and sci-fi, right? Especially the early part of the 20th century. And world building is then really taken to its its realization point by Robert E. Howard, J.R. Tolkien, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and others who create not only character stories, but stories about entire worlds. And the characters then become recurrent or they almost become pawns in this larger scheme of how this world is unfolding. Then you fast forward to nowadays, world building has become arguably one of the most profitable industries in the world on earth, right? Which is something like, say, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Okay, so we take a set of movies which is no longer about a single character or group of characters, but about this unfolding of a world. And uh, as uh, one of the great introductions to the Hellboy graphic novel that I love, it, it talks about how comics were once the, the side shoot of entertainment and now have become the archetype for which a lot of entertainment is built, as the comic book is now the frontier and the movies are following that frontier. And this is true also with world building. Comic books have been doing world building long before Hollywood, in my opinion. Comic books were building worlds where numerous issues and side shoots and crossovers and variations all occurred. And what made comic books so fascinating, especially for me in the 80s, is that you could read multiple comics and they would all be fueling this sense of a world. And that world spanned dimensions and timelines and planets. It was massive. And now you can see this confluence conceptually which is that D&D, &D, well, role-playing in general, is much more like a comic book than it is a movie because you have all these different stories and different splinters, different elements that are coming together, especially over time, to form this sense of a world. And that world being much more than a planet, much more than a continent, but a set of timelines, a set of realities that all intercombine. So I think it's educational to look at the history of the term and, and the evolution of the term to get a, a sense of context for yourself, for myself, in this spectrum of sort of um, creative tools, right? And this creative tool is the tool of world building. It's thinking about where are they? What, what is unfolding? Uh, what factors are at play and what will they see and experience? You see, the difference is that in a character-driven creative tool set. You don't ask, where are they? You ask, who are they? Who are my people? Hmm. Blah, 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 blah. That's a different form of creativity than world building. And this is sort of where we want to play. Okay. So that, I wouldn't even call that a history of the term, but that is a super cursory, you know, slide across. We just did a water slide of what happened. So this, this goes back um, a couple of hundred years. And I'm sure the concept of uh, developing a robust setting predates the use of the term world building by centuries more. It's just that's where we get the term. Okay, so there's just a little quick, you know, look back. And now what I want to talk about is these sort of the, the traditional binary reduction of the activity of world building into two approaches or methods. And these are approaches are the top down method and the bottom up method. Now, the top-down method, I think, is the most stereotypical method of world building or sort of uh, what pops in your mind when you hear the term. Hey, yo, dude, what are you up to today? Oh, man, I'm just up in my crib. I'm just kicking it here doing some world building on my new campaign. Oh, word? You like drawing continents and stuff? Boom. So if you're the first thing you do when you're world building is draw continents. 
then you are absolutely going from the top down. An even bigger version of it would be to draw like a map of the planes or a, a map of multiple planets or of a solar system or something. You want to talk about top down. So top in this explanation means a far out view and bottom means a close in view. Top is the bird's eye or almost God view and bottom is the human or ant view. Now doing world building from the top down is something we're all familiar with. It's where I make continents, I name towns, I make mountain ranges, I make cultures, I make species, races, I make a heritage, I make a timeline, I create wars, I create entire civilizations that have risen and fallen, I make eons of time, I, I sculpt with, with meteors and with suns. I am a colossal god in my creation of this world. Nothing is beyond my power, and I create it from this viewpoint. It's very hard to see an individual from this viewpoint. The reason that this method is often employed in the RPG hobby to build worlds is that the individuals are not the purview of the world creator. They are the purview of the player. The player arrives in this world and decides who they're going to be. And this dichotomy between the godlike world creator, the dungeon master, and the individual mortal human being, the player, is part of what makes the hobby so interesting. The dungeon master doesn't know who the characters are going to be and therefore gives the player a sense of free will or of agency inside this world. The dungeon master creates the stage but does not tell the actors what to say. If the dungeon master were to tell the actors what to say, then when the players came over, they would eat your Cheetos but they would be very bored. <laughs> you see, this, and this is a lot like real life. In, an, in a silly way, which is that the uh, illusion of or the um, hope of free will is what makes existing in the world interesting. And this is true of us in real life. Making our own choices is why we live, why we continue to hunger for life. It's freedom. Whether it's real or illusory is almost for scholars to pick at because for us, we feel that excitement and that adventure of sculpting our own lives with our own choices. That's the purview of the player. And this is why in top-down world building, the dungeon master simply creates everything from a godlike point of view. They don't create individuals. They create races of individuals. They don't create the sentences that individuals will say. They create the languages that will be used. This method, I think, is A, not my favorite, and B, easy to understand why it's so tempting. It's so fun to gouge canyons with your fingers, right? To shatter continents with your fist, to form the, the globes of planets in the palm of your hand. It's a good feeling. We are trapped in mortal bodies and mortal minds, and we do not get to do this. And so if the fun of this hobby is the expansive imagining of things, then it makes perfect sense that this top-down world building is very, very tempting. It's so fun to be an axiomatic infinite god. You can fill in the gaps for every world that's ever disappointed you. You can lay the stage for the greatest epic saga that will ever be told, but you don't actually have to deal with all the dialogue. You can set up mountain ranges that maybe someday will be explored, but you don't have to describe in detail how the mountaineering party found their way through the nooks and crannies and chasms. It's very tempting. Now, you probably are sensing this, but me using words like tempting gives away my opinion of top-down world building, but we're going to save that for just a second. Let's talk about the other side. Now, the clear counterpoint to top-down world building is bottom-up world building. Now, generally, I'm not a fan of this kind of yin-yang thinking, right? Let's talk about a topic. We'll take one side and the other, and that's every side. 
Obviously, that is not the case here. There are a million ways to attack world building, but these are the two most widely recognized methods. So bottom up is where I begin with a single person. It's Willow finding the baby, the daikini in the river. Now, as a dungeon master, if I'm creating a world and the only fact I know, the only thing I'm certain of, the only thing I've written down in my journal is Willow, who is this short little dude who's kind of just, you know, a farmer. One day he's out walking on his land and he finds a baby floating in a basket. This is a vastly, vastly different mindset for world building than to draw a continent on a map. And you guys can instantly feel it, right? So there's things that have already been established about my world when I tell you that Willow found a baby floating in a basket. First of all, we know that there are sort of like little short people, kind of like, you know, halflings or, you know, shire folk, right? We know that. We know that this is a human-like world because a baby, unfortunately, a baby being abandoned in a basket is a myth that we're all familiar with, mainly because of Moses, right? And, and we're familiar with this concept of a, a baby being born into some kind of political turmoil, but being important and being placed in a basket and some unsuspecting soul discovers this basket and our adventure begins. So we, we have a lot of foggy assumptions because of this tiny scene. But the truth is we have only seen five seconds of this world from five feet away. And the other thing that's revealed here is that we have a somewhat familiar geography. If there's a river and a farmer and reeds and a basket, okay, I think I, I kind of know where I am a little bit. I'm on an earth-like place. If I'm building from the top down, I can do anything. The entire world can be made out of glass-like pink stone, right? <laughs> we have absolutely no footing. But if I tell you that a, a Shire folk farmer wades through the reeds and finds a baby floating in a basket. This comes with loads of assumptions, loads of assumptions. Okay, so now let's talk a little wider for a moment. Bottom-up world building involves taking human detail and starting there and then letting yourself find what the world is moment by moment as the story and the emotion and the choices unfold. Now, clearly, there are some huge pitfalls to this style of world building. Remember, your goal is not to tell the story of Willow and the baby in the basket. That's not why you're here. You're here to build a world. And so if you choose to do it from bottom up, you've got some real peril ahead, namely inconsistency. Where is this river? Where is it relative to the mountains where the bad guys have their fortress? Which direction is which in this world? Are there normal seasons? What kind of technology does Willow have? Are, are, is baskets like, are baskets the highest tech thing in this world? I don't know. Do they have spaceships? I don't freaking know. I don't know anything. All I know is the tiny set of assumptions that come with a Shireling finding a baby in a basket. Therefore, the joy of bottom-up world building is that you get this touchable feeling, this tangible human sort of blood and sweat feeling that is very, very real. But you do not get a nice, big, complete world. <laughs> you just don't. And if you're creating it as you go, as Willow explores, you're only one step ahead of him as the, as the world builder. You only know what's in the next mile of his journey, not what's in the next 10, right? If you do it that way, the, you are bound for loads of inconsistencies. How far things are apart, how long ago things happened, how far ahead the threat is, What's to the north? What's to the south? You don't know the answers to any of these things. You're bumbling and stumbling your way into the facts of your world. And anyone who has read my novels knows that I am a terrible perpetrator on this front. I use the bottom-up method. And the distances and relationships of places and times and people and, and, and landmarks in my world is slightly plastic. It's slightly fluid. But herein lies my thesis that I would like to put forward to you guys on the world building subject. And then we're going to get into some specifics, okay? This thesis is 
beware, he who designeth top down. The pitfalls and the hazards of designing a world from the bottom up, to me, are the world. The inconsistencies are the world. They are what makes it so damn interesting. Because we as human beings do not have access to the, to the infinite truth. Now, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. It is a blast to know the infinite truth, to know all of the planets in the solar system, to know all of their continents, to know all the species of monsters, to know where all the coastlines begin and end, where the mountains rise and fall, what races await us, what wonders await but no one character knows any of that stuff in its totality. And so what you will wind up with is a beautiful, gigantic, sterile world. It is only the view of a world through a limited perspective, one camera, if you will, that gives us meaningful insight and I would argue, as a dungeon master, huge sweeping descriptions are not very useful to you as in um, relationship to your players as a tool to bring your players into the world. You know what's useful to you? One or two well-delivered lines from an NPC. An NPC is your camera inside your world and has to feel desire, has to feel confusion and fear and distress, and they do not know where the mountains end. They don't know how far it is to the ocean. And for you to, as the world builder, to be more concerned with how far it actually is to the ocean rather than how far this one NPC, this fruit vendor, in this one town, in the town of Shropshire, how far he thinks it is to the ocean, for you to think it's more important what the absolute truth is than what he believes, that to me is the temptation, the, the unfortunate temptation of top-down world building because the absolute truth is less useful to you in immersing your players in the game than the relative truth, than the single perspective truth. So let's say the fruit vendor thinks it's 50 miles to the ocean because your players need to go get a ship. The next person they meet in town, the, the pants tailor. <laughs> I'm just not a normal tailor. I specialize in pants. He knows for a fact he's got a little map that a friend gave to him. No, it's only 10 miles to the ocean. How far it is to the ocean is not interesting. What's interesting is that one person told them 10 miles and the other told them 50, and they don't know which is true. This is epistemology. This is our limited access to the absolute truth that makes our lives so fascinating. It makes the adventure the adventure. Have you ever gotten this feeling that in the modern world we have GPSs and we have navigation on our phones and everything, and sometimes going and discovering a new place seems less magical than maybe it could be? That's because the absolute truth is at our fingertips. But to not be sure where the next bend is in the trail... And then to have the confidence to go anyway and to be ready anyway, to be equipped, to be supplied and to make it and to find that bend and discover it's a little less far, but not quite as far as I thought it would be. <laughs> that, that is the excitement of life. And I would argue the excitement of adventures. And so to bring people into that excitement, my thesis is that bottom up world building is where it's at. You start with a single moment and it's all you know about the world, but it's a moment and here's where you still get to be God. It's a moment you want. A moment that when you look within as a creative person, you want to see happen. You want to see Conan lopping the head off of a giant snake. Okay, there's your moment. What is this world? Well, I know a few things. There's a sword. There's a muscly dude named Conan, and there's a giant snake. So apparently there's like giant beasts in this world. Ooh, interesting. Giant beasts. That makes a cool bullet point in my world building. But wait a minute. Why is he lopping the head off this snake? Ooh, now that is an interesting question. And I would argue a far more difficult question. And why is it more difficult? Because what we're about to talk about, which is the difference between the general and the specific. The general says, this continent has squiggly coastlines. 
I don't care, to be honest. The specific says Conan had to lop the head off the snake because he was chained in the pit. And he was chained there by the dark wizard Thulsa Doom. Oh, wait, there's wizards in this world. And not only are there wizards, there's a dark one. And he's, he's aligned against Conan. Already, this is so much more fascinating to me than exactly how arrayed the mountains and the coastlines may be. What use are the mountains and the coastlines to me when I'm making my first character? Almost none. But what use is knowing that Thulsa Doom has Conan chained in a pit? And I, too, am chained in this pit. This is, this is suchness. This is substance. I can latch my will onto these details and begin improvising new details immediately. And this is why I argue that bottom-up world building is so stinking fascinating. But the reason we're so drawn to the high view, the bird view, is that it's general. It's easy. It's easy to be like, well, I'm not quite sure what the stories are going to be. So I'm just going to sort of, you know, do some coastlines and some mountains and some town names and stuff. Yeah, but you're honestly, you're creatively procrastinating at that moment. You're putting off what really needs to be done, which is some specifics. And so I would argue the bottom-up modality of world building is where it's at, baby. Ooh, it's so tasty. All right, so if that's the case, let's take some time and talk about specific examples and specific creative moments or bits that we can latch onto as like, ooh, I see Okay, I see why you're saying this, Unker and Bernal. I see why you're saying bottom up is cool. Look at how all, ooh, look at that substance that's built into there, okay? So let's take a look at some, some specifics here. I'd like to talk about two key examples. And these are examples that don't come from just anywhere. These come right here from the, from the farm. And the first is how I opened my first novel and how I used it in my world building. And the second is some world building currently being done by my man, Matt Shaker, which is namely the Sea of Rust. And there's some interesting comparisons between these two things and the journey that the two of us have been on doing this creative work, I think, is uh, luminous for the topic. So when I began my first book, it was really just a writing challenge, and I just wanted to write for the sake of writing, almost just as a daily exercise. And I wrote that scene where Vald is walking down the path and is ambushed by goblins who have, um, you know, sort of high-level poison on their arrows, even though they're low-level chumps, and they're going to sort of fight Vald, okay? That's all I knew. That was literally all I knew. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not making this up for the sake of argument. I knew nothing about my novel or my world or anything all I knew is I wanted a big, cool dude in bun- like heavy armor walking down this path, and he's kind of distracted by something just long enough for these goblins to shoot him with poison arrows. And he's normally immune to all poison. He- this guy is like super high level. He's like 15th level in D&D terms. But this poison was given to these goblins by other political forces. This is all I knew. I did not know who those political forces were. I didn't know what the larger story was. I didn't even know where this guy was going. He's just walking down some meaningless path. But instantly I started getting all these tidbits. You know, then I gave, I gave him this sort of legendary sword with these nine buckles on the scabbard. And then he had this sort of dark demeanor as if he had just come from something else that was sort of went badly. And now he had to walk all the way home. Like, where's his whole royal escort? This guy's like a knight, right? Oh, wait, there's a royal escort. There are kings and queens in this world. Who are they? I don't know. Wait a minute. There are goblins. That's kind of a cliche monster. Is this like a cliche fantasy world? I don't know. (laughs) But for me, this is how I began it. And it's how I continued the exercise. And eventually it became the entire world of Alfheim. All from one moment, which is a guy in plate mail walking down a path. Now, it is selfish to say this worked for me really well. And so I think it's the best way to do things, right? That's a a very narrow minded sort of creative professor statement, right? This worked for me. So it's got to be the best way, guys. So do it my way. 
Now, I, I can't deny that I'm critical of myself in that regard, but I also can't deny that I just stink and believe it. I think that the suchness and the, the likability of my novels for what it is um, comes from this approach. And I, I also think it's part of my life as a human being. I try to talk about my side of things, my honesty, my reality, what, what I'm going through. And that's a bottom-up approach too. And then to say, well, this is part of my life, and so this is what's best in life. Well, that's just a jump in in confidence that I would love everyone to feel. And obviously, I don't feel that confidence all the time. Only when I'm in my strong state, right, my conqueror state, do I feel this is what my life is, and though therefore, this is what is best in life. How rarely we feel that. But when we do, what a feeling it is. And so I want to just, as a coach, say creatively, go for it. Take specifics, revel in your time, and create your worlds this way. Okay, so that's sort of my angle on how I started creating Alfheim. One character at a time, and not even character, but one moment. I didn't really even know who Vald was. I didn't come up with his history or a sense of his stats or his equipment or anything like that. I just knew it was a big old dude in armor with like a great sword, and this great sword was sort of an artifact of this world. And especially when it came to the building of Red Fang, I originally thought of Red Fang as a person. And then Red Fang also became this sword and they're kind of intertwined. And none of that was planned as part of my world. It was all accidental. And for me, that process was so fun and so rife with discovery and excitement. That's why I want to coach it to others is to, is to try it, to, to let the unknown wash over you rather than try to wrangle it and squeeze some of the creative life out of the energy that you feel when you're world building. Now, let's stop there for a moment with Alfheim and let's swing our telescope all the way out into the world of Warp Shell where Matt Shaker is creating this world called the Sea of Rust. Now, as the name implies, you could probably start to imagine the Sea of Rust is this junk planet. It's like a dumpster planet. And we've done a few adventures on Matt's world, and he can't, he keeps kind of revisiting and saying, you know, I kind of want to think about Sea of Rust. And God bless him, he goes through this creative struggle with himself. He says, well, on the one hand, I want to tell this one little story about this malfunctioning droid that is in these piles of trash, and these huge barges are dumping trash. There's this malfunctioning droid and these little terminals. And he's kind of wandering from terminal to terminal, trying to find his fate in this world, right? This little malfunctioning droid is basically our willow finding the baby in the basket. This is a very short range view of the Sea of Rust. And we as characters might stumble into this. In our case, we crashed our spaceship there and met this little malfunctioning droid. So that would be the bottom up method. But then I also see Matt saying, you know... Maybe instead of trying to tell this one little story, maybe what I should do is just come up with a bunch of sort of adventure hooks, locations, cool ideas, and kind of, you know, cobble them together into this big list. And then, you know, people can sandbox it as they choose and so on and so forth. Now, I think that's also a cool way to create the Sea of Rust. But I think that very quickly, my mind winds up in the planet of the Junkions from Transformers my mind very quickly goes to the sort of the uh, the suburbs in Blade Runner. And my mind very quickly basically goes to a place where I'm more confused. I'm not quite sure what this world is <clears throat> the minute I try to see it from the, from the sky, from the stratosphere. But I think what's interesting here is that neither one is absolutely the right answer. And... Keeping your creative passion alive is letting yourself do whichever feels fun. If you want to just think inside this poor little malfunctioning droid's life, I think you're going to get a lot of details that are going to be, quote unquote, more useful to players. But remember what I said earlier, what we decided earlier? You don't need an outcome to your world building. So if it's more fun for Matt to build the Sea of Rust at a, as a planet which it's a brilliant idea, by the way. You can have all kinds of fun. You can have layers underneath this world where the computers are still functioning. You can have different cultures who have adapted to the junk in different ways, a lot like uh, Sakaar, right? So on Sakaar, they have a similar thing. It's like a dumpster planet. You have salvagers. You have the arena games. You have all these different aspects of life there, and it's very interesting. 
But in Ragnarok, we discover Sakaar from the bottom up, basically with Thor slamming into the ground and these sort of scavengers walking up and go like, are you a fighter or are you food? So when you hear this line, are you a fighter or are you food? It really does reveal a ton about Sakaar. But then later, you know, we're introduced to Sakaar as a high concept when Thor enters the Grandmaster's chamber, right? And so even in that movie, we see both sides of world building. We see the bottom up, namely one line, one moment, and we see the top down. Welcome to Sakaar, blah, 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 blah. And so I think it's interesting. And what I want to encourage is if you're wobbling back and forth between the bottom up and the top down, then that's not some kind of difficulty or some kind of problem. You're wonderful. You're the thing. You're the creative person. And now I I want to bring this all home down into a, a nice little knot, which is world building is sometimes the way that we escape DM burnout. DM burnout is where we feel like we have to show up the same time at a thing each week. We feel just like used up. And sometimes what you want to do is throw it all away. You want to clean your desk off and you want to get a nice blank notebook and you want to just start with a brand new, brand new, brand new. (laughs) And so this is what I want to kind of bring it all around to now. When it comes to the extremely difficult question of DM burnout, I have two answers for you guys. One, quit DMing. This is supposed to be fun. This is not a job. If you're tired and you're creatively weary and it feels like an obligation, take a break. Don't ruin your hobby by thinking you need to come through for others. And don't ruin what you enjoy most in life by overdoing it. Just stop. Stop DMing if you're burnt out. Just quit. Take a break. And I'm talking about a break. I'm taking like a year or two off here. The other one, a far less extreme answer, is the topic of this podcast, which is world building. Take a break from the world you're DMing or worlds you're DMing. Get yourself a blank book, a blank piece of paper, a new Google Doc, and just ask yourself what would be cooler. What would be more fun? What would be bigger? What would fix all the errors that I've blundered into with this other world? What would give my players something more exciting to explore? What little individual mortal story is more fascinating than the ones I'm seeing right now in my game or in my fiction or in whatever? (laughs) What kind of planet would be cool? Where do I want to be? Who am I? Am I that little dis- that little malfunctioning droid in the sea of rust? Or am I the seven-foot-tall, armor-clad warrior walking down the path? These two creative seeds, these two moments lead us down vastly different paths of exploration. And asking that question in total freedom is the opposite of needing to follow through on last week's game with this week's game because now they're in the Underdark and I need to make some Underdark stuff. And, oh, I'm getting so tired of making Underdark stuff, right? That's DM burnout. That's why world building is always so intriguing to us. It's a fresh start. Everything begins again as we see those opening credits and we hear Galadriel describing what's happened in the last 3,000 years. And there's this picture of dark water in the woods. Anything could happen. Anything could come next. As the dungeon master, we're completely free. And this is what I want to give you for the end of episode 27 of the RPG mainframe. It's drive free or die, jugger. As a dungeon master, sometimes it can rejuvenate you to be completely free. And this is the art of world building, creative freedom. You can do and become anything. So revel in it. And if you want to be free down on the bottom end, like what's the slang of this one driver in Junked? Or if you want to be free on the top end, how does an entire universe intercombine to create an adventure for players? Either one. Whatever is the most freeing for you, because I think the essence of DM burnout is you feel that your freedom is disappearing both in your weekly pattern of life as well as your creative options. You're needing to do this, that, or the other thing. You're obliged to do this, or the other, that's that, or the other thing. No, not in world building. You are free. And the beautiful thing about freedom is that it asks us, 
the most critical question of life, whether you're talking about your life as a whole or your creative life, which is that if you have freedom, what will you do with it? And the answer to that question is your creative expression. So own it, enjoy it, and revel in your time. Drive free or die, jugger. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. This is Unkren Bernal up in northern Runeham area, and this has been Runehammer. Thank you for your ongoing support. As my shield wall ever growing, we are coming up on some milestones soon. I really want to hit that 500 patron mark because it's going to be a party up in this. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Keep it real. Don't steal. And you're always going to get a deal. Strength, honor, and fear. Now go build your worlds. And I'll see you on the other side, Ray.